welcome back to another Summertime Conversations on Feeling Good with Myself, Dr. Grace Gibson, and my lovely co-host, Dr. Kaniqua Robinson. Hey, so we are back and just a little snippet, just in case you all are maybe tuning in for the first time and didn't catch our last one, tune mm -hmm. into that if you didn't. Um, our summertime conversations was inspired by Nina Simone's 1965 classic song, Feeling Good. And so feeling good, these summertime conversations are exploring the lived experiences of black joy as this free form dialogue that foreground, foregrounds how people of African descent created communal agency and collective resilience mm -hmm. via this cultivation of joy. So yeah. What better moment in time than also to you know recognize Black Music Month, which is this month of June, with the yes. sonic curation. So, yes. uh, Kanika, tell us a little bit more. Like, like what we're gonna be doing today? What we're gonna be talking about? First, I want to talk about. I want to ask, what uh, what does Nina Simone? What does she mean to you? Like, what does Nina Simone mean to you? Yeah, so Nina Simone is somebody who like pushed against the box as far as personality, as far as music wise. Uh, for her, she was, every time I think about artists who wanted to be different, she comes to mind. Like right. she was one of those right. who was like, you know what, if y'all don't like me here in America, that's okay. I'll leave. I'll go over to Europe. I'll go over to other places where they will appreciate me. Right. Respect that. I'm like, yes, I'm all for that. Um, she had a very distinct voice. She had a very distinct sound. Uh, she, you know, her music is what I saw as message music. Right, um, right. So the thing about it from the tone to the lyrics, I just always vibe with. And, you know, she had a variety of different types of songs as well too, and for instruments and so forth. So, um, I, you know, I, was ne I never had the privilege to like see her live, but I've watched many of her live performances. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, she put on a show. Yes. Entertained. So yeah. I think I I believe I was introduced to Nina Simone when I was young. Okay. But I did not really appreciate her until later, like college. And one thing I like about her and I appreciate about Nina Simone is the fact that I and it could just be, you know, some people may think it's like superficial, but I love how she celebrated her skin. I love how she celebrated her blackness. Yep. And even you talked about her voice. I loved her voice. So I have a deeper tone. And you know, hearing how she just embraced everything about herself, that meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And then even the fact of the song, this series is called Feeling Good, Feeling Good. Yes. She was free, free in her blackness. And we know that, you know, she may have been dealing with some mental health issues, but she was free in her blackness. Right. And I think. That's one thing I appreciate, of course, on music, of course, like it was amazing. But that's what I appreciate about her music, her freedom and her blackness, her saying to be young, gifted and black, you know, to really, really talk about who we truly are, even in the midst of, you know, racism that was going on, all those inequalities or stereotypes that were put forth about us. She was like, this is who we are, you know, love your blackness. But I also, truly appreciated too, like you said, about this loving blackness. She also talked about like the role of artists and the role of, you know, what they play in, in life and in society. So there's a YouTube clip that I typically, I tend to show in my classes all the time about her and you all can, you know, just check it out. It's, you know, her talking about, you know, the artist's purpose. What is, what is their role? What do they bring to you? Why they are important? So, um, yeah. So, it, it, you know, it just was so fitting that, you know, our conversations are called Feeling Good and also the fact that, you know, this is Black Music Month that, you know, it just all kind of like culminates and comes together. So, um, yeah. plus, you know, we're also talking about joy, happiness and, and you know, communal fellowship, all these great mm -hmm. things. So. Yes. Yeah. So it is fitting that, you know, we're talking about this, you know, her at the, in this month of celebrating our music in the music industry mm -hmm. and I really appreciate having this month and I believe it was started by Jimmy Carter in 1979. He, he made official. He right. made it um, an official month, uh, Black Music Month. But then later, Barack Obama changed it to African American yeah. Music right. Month. Right. So, I, I think 
I think it was African American Music Appreciation Month. You know, it doesn't have quite the the pizzazz, but you know. <laughs> Not quite the same. It's not quite the same, but you know, we still call it Black Music Month. Appreciate his efforts, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it really wasn't, I think maybe recently within, I'd say probably like the last five years that I realized that this was a month. Like, you know, to because to me, and I'm sure probably for you too, you know, I appreciate Black music all the time. So I every day. Realized it was a, a month dedicated to it. And so, um, and you know would later also find out that it was called National Black Music Month. Mm -hmm. So um, there was this Philadelphia uh, producer named Kenny Gamble mm -hmm. who had in the 70s was inspired by basically the Country Music Association, which kind of led him to say, you know what, maybe we need to start thinking about, you know, black music and appreciating mm -hmm. it. And, you know, he had this idea of a vision of preserving, protecting and perpetuating black music. So it's like, yeah, we definitely need to do that considering as we'll talk about a little later especially the preserving and protecting part uh, <laughs> it's really important that we do that with as it relates to black music and what it is and what it's all about so yeah right absolutely agree with that and i'm glad you know again we have this month to really even more celebrate our music and our the contributions of black music to the music industry Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one thing I want to discuss, like, how would you define black music? What is black music? You know, black music is all kind of genres. It mm -hmm. is, you know, and then not necessarily just genres. It's a movement. It's it's moments. Mm -hmm. It's feelings. You know, um, it's They're stories. It's They're stories. Story. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It it takes us in different times. Because you know, music is always constantly evolving and changing. It's building off of you know each other, so um, we can always connect it to different places, people. You know, right. it's historical um, because we can think about you know. I think about the the spirituals during you know um, enslavement and how that was how people worked. You know, singing these spirituals, getting through the day. You know, I think about church and being in the children's choir and singing you know the song and then eventually being in the adult choir and get to sing the older adult songs and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those moments you know um watching soul train and you know you know seeing the dancing and the and the music and the singing so it's not just like vocal it's also musical in the sense of just instrument so yeah i mean i think there's really no one definition of, of, of black music, it, it, it's constantly changing and evolving and um, it, it has so much to offer. Like I'm yeah. excited about black music all the time because it's like, what are we gonna get today? And I, I like how you said it's also, it's not just about music in, in regards to vocal and even instruments. It's about, well, it, how we use our bodies as instruments. So it's the dancing, you know, and even, and I know, I think we talked about Sandman in one of our episodes on Harlem Night, and how he would have sand and he would have like that to me, that is music. Yeah. And um, even we have the stereotype, well, we don't, but you know, it's held that black music is really hip hop. Right. And we have no roots in other um, music genres, but we do. And so I think black music is diverse. It is something that should not be defined. Right. Um, that cannot be defined. You can say it's a part of our culture, but it's hard to say it's just one thing, you know? And so even when we think about the different genres, it do tell a story. It do tell our past and our present in songs. Like even now during the Black Lives Matter movement, you have rappers talking about police brutality and things like that in their songs. Outcast, which we'll talk about later, use music to really talk about what was going on in East Point, in College Park, in the Georgia area. So music does a lot for um, to help our spirits, to help us experience joy. It's, it's multiple. It has multiple goals for us. Mm -hmm. it, it goes back to something else I had looked up. So like I said, you mentioned Jimmy Carter made it, you know, official in June of 1979. Mm -hmm. um, good old Bill Clinton made it uh, an official proclamation, um, you know, in that and later, you know, later in during his presidency. Um, and he would say something that, you know, sometimes he don't say too much, but he said something that was, you know, significant in, you know, the purpose of Black Music Month. 
And he, was, he said, quote, recognizing the importance of African-American music to global culture and calling on the people of the United States to study, reflect on, and celebrate African-American music. Mm. And I said, that, that's, that's on point mm. right there. Like, especially the whole global culture. Right, right, right. U.S. Like, Black music is not just relegated to the United States. Mm. It is global. It is right. all over the world. You go somewhere, anywhere, pick a place, and you will see the impact and the role of Black music. I mean, like I said, mm. about Nina Simone. She left the United States and said, I'm, I'm going over here to wherever. And, you know, and they ate up her music and still do. They still do. They so still do. Um, even like Josephine Baker, she left. She said, OK, we're done here. Let's go. And she she had fame there as well. And even our music was borrowed. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Not borrowed. I'm sorry. Stolen or taken by people from. You think that worked? Those words work? They were taken by white artists in the UK yeah. who became popular from black music from the US. Mm -hmm. But you know, now, you know, going back up to your point about the global nature of black music, it's like we borrow from all global cultures in itself. Like we bring, because you know, our blackness is not just, you know, situated in the US. So we borrow from music like Afrobeats. We yeah. take it from, you know, different countries in Africa. We um there are rap artists and great cultural revolution in um the UK that we borrow from as well. So yeah, it's, it's not this way. The importance is yes, we're going to constantly borrow. Mm -hmm. You know, the key thing is acknowledging the borrowing, acknowledging mm -hmm. the fact that I didn't originate this, that this came from somewhere else. That's the important, because it's like sharing is caring, but let's also acknowledge where it came from, that you were not the beginning okay. and that, you know, it had to come from somewhere you were influenced by a, a movement of uh, an idea, a sound, you know, so that's really, you know, um, true important, you know, thing when it comes to, you know, the idea of borrowing. I, so, I like that sharing is caring because yeah. I, I don't want to go back to that because it's like, if you care when you, when you borrowed or take, took from um, black musicians, then why haven't black musicians benefited financially? Exactly. And from, that's the key thing that has come up even more so in recent years as it relates to Black Music Month is like giving credit where credit is due financially, um, you know, just note, noteworthy wise, you know, it, the acknowledgement is really important and it's, um, it's key. So Definitely. when we think of, when you think about Black music, what are some of the, you know, the genres that you think about when you think about Black music? I like how you brought up spirituals because spirituals were key. And even some spirituals doing enslavement, um, included like how do you say like ways to freedom so it wasn't just spiritual you know not only for god and to exalt god and to help one way was to help alleviate the pain or the stress of or the struggles of slave enslavement but also in these songs were maps to freedom like they were singing things within this the spirituals um to say okay this is how you run away like get the code so there was coding so you think about the intelligence of our people how they were using music to even help escape or to gather people to escape. And then, you know, so I just want to throw out school because I'm sorry I stole that from you. But also, I like blue because you think about the Mississippi Delta blue yeah. and how it really told the story of sharecroppers and, you know, their experiences post, you know, emancipation, post um, enslavement and the Civil War. So they told about what it was like to sharecrop. And you see how even blues transform when they went north, because they were like, oh, I don't want to hear the sorrowful songs that came out of this Mississippi Delta. And you see the change in blues, how it, it even changed in regards to what the electric guitar, I can't remember who um, came up with that, uh, not came up with it, but who brought the electric guitar north. But even then, it's like, I love that, this change, where it really was a part of our culture. You have this one aspect of it who's like, okay, we're in the sharecrop, we're in the field right now even after emancipation, but then you go up north and it's like, it's this new boom, this migration, this newness. Yeah, those things. Yeah, so definitely blues, definitely, you know, spirituals and gospel. I remember hearing that all the time in the house, you know, not just on Sunday, <laughs> it, was, it was all the time. And um, then like your grandparents would be singing. Yes. They were like randomly singing. You, like, I, I'm not gonna sing it. But my grandmother would sing this one song and I remember it. Like I still remember it like it was yesterday. It all, it, when I hear it, it reminds me of her. 
Exactly. Because again, it was always a way to, or it was always turning the house of spiritual of some sort. Yep. Made you feel good. Made you feel good. Um, oh. And with the blues, like for me, I remember hearing that and it was kind of sometimes seen as like, you know, that not bad, but it was like opposite of a spirit, the spirituals in the sense mm -hmm. of, you know, oh, you know, they singing them blues because, you know, something happened to them or, you know, they ain't got, they lost their woman, they lost their man, you know, they lost their job. You know, it was always some other connotation connected to it that was not necessarily the best thing, but it was able to, you know, like you said earlier, tell a story. It was able to say, I, you know, this happened to me. This wasn't right. I'm gonna put it to a beautiful sound. Um, another thing for me was um, that I, you know, when I think about black music, it's jazz, and uh, like uh -huh. I, I work very well with jazz. Like I like to play jazz in the background when I'm I'm reading or writing, uh, or when I'm cleaning up around the house. Uh, you know, it's just very, it can be calming, but it can also be upbeat. You know, that's the great thing about jazz. It has so many different entry points. Yes, it does. Um, and you can have you know, the vocal. So sometimes it's just straight in instrumental, then you have the vocal, so then you get into like scatting, then you get into, you know, just, uh, you name it, you know, jazz just has so many levels to it. Yes, it does, levels yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely and, jazz hits me in a, in, a, in a unique way too. And going back to spirituals, and even how spirituals has become gospel, because you know, you have, what is it, contemporary, Christian music. I don't know what the other uh -huh. Yeah. You have this gospel. And even then, how gospel has changed, but again, it's a certain type of rhythm, a certain type of beat, a certain type of musicianship that's involved in the gospel. Yep. And so I just want to add that. Um, also, what's another one? I really like, I love RB. One of my favorite artists is David Face. I love RB. Just want to throw it out there. That's very important to me. And um, rock and roll. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you know I love Tina Turner you know we don't need another hero is my song but like you know I feel as though she's gotten credit because she's Tina Turner in her documentary I want to go back to it I think I may have said it in the last um podcast but I want to say it again so during the documentary they said something like um Tina Turner is the new was the the original Mick Jagger mm. And that messed me up. I was like, Mick Jagger got, you know, copy from her. Yeah. So even in that word choice, yes, they are acknowledging that she was the forerunner to this type of music. They still had to talk about her only in comparison to Mick Jagger. Yeah. As though her only claim to fame was Mick Jagger. Yeah. She's Tina Turner. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Sorry, I said that out there. Yeah. No, I mean, and when you think about it's interesting. Um, I had I remember a student in one of my classes did a presentation on you know blackness and rock and roll, and yeah. you know the fact that for many people that's new to them. Yes. Like black people and rock and roll. I'm like actually we kind of originated that. We we've been there since the beginning with like many other genres. Like so it's who like, was the main people? Like Little Richard was thought was one of the originators of rock and roll. Come on. Yep. So it's like, we've been there, you know, but this is a story that we repeatedly have to tell. Yes. You know, that we, we, we knew, we ain't new to this, you know, so, you know, <laughs> you know, knowing that rock and roll is something that, you know, becomes like this new thing when we see Blackness enter into it. It's like a new thing for people. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, this mm -hmm. isn't new. Like, maybe it's a re-entry. Maybe it's, um, a re you know, um, people are, are, are understanding it and clear about it now, but this is, is not new. It's, it's, it's similar to when Missy uh, came out with Katy Perry at the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Yes. And people yes. were promoting Missy's song, like, oh my God, who is this Missy Elliott? And, and we're like, uh, Missy been out for a good little minute. Like before Katy Perry, Missy Elliott was somebody and it's still right. something. And it's still. <laughs> it just, <laughs> I was like, people are like, bring her up like she's brand new. And it's like, no. Mm -mm. Her sales skyrocketed after that. Right. It was, like you said, oh, have you heard Missy's old song? Like, what are we doing here? So, I mean, because I've been a fan of Missy, as you know, since the beginning. 
Yeah. I was with her with Tim Lamagu. It was us. So, yes. Oh, so, so. Yeah. I mean, you see that a lot where people are now um, understanding music more and understanding more Black artists. We're still not there. I personally, I don't feel as though we're there yet. But we do need to understand that in all musical genres, Black people have had a strong impact. Yep. And, you know, it's oddly enough, and we'll talk about it later because, you know, you tend to see white artists in roles or in genres being um, exhausted over Black artists in, in genres that are considered white. Right. Mm -hmm. In genres that are considered Black, which is, you know, the blues and hip hop, um, it does not, first of all, those genres do not get the same appreciation. Exactly, exactly. And even those artists do not get the same appreciation as white rap artists. Right. right. Uh, and but that's a conversation we'll need to have a little bit later. <laughs> so, you know, when it's all said and done, like Black Music Month definitely is very much about visibility. Yes, it is. And much like a lot of things that, especially you and I, and definitely in our research, you know, mm -hmm. visibility is very important. You have to, we have to make visible those people who are made to be pushed to the mark that have been pushed right. to We have to make sure those people's stories are made visible and are told that are otherwise underappreciated, that are seen as less than, right. are not given the credit and um, you know the, the noteworthiness that others you know may get. Right, right. Um, and it's not just about the mainstream artists, it's about independent artists. Like mm -hmm. I'm you know, for me, I'm thinking about this group called Soul to Soul, who um, I remember them from in the 90s in high school. And, you know, I, that, this may be dating myself, but, I, you know, I know I've got some fans out there who remember Soul to Soul and <laughs> who, who remember their songs. And, you know, for me, that was kind of like my early engagement with R&B before, mm. with, you know, the R&B that we have. Or, um, you know, definitely um, Tony, Tony, Tone. You know, um, who else is, I'm, I'm like trying to reflect back on some groups and, and singers from like the 90s and 80s. Boys to Men, After Seven. Oh, Portrait. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. you got that. So, and uh, those are just a few, like you, we could you know, go on and on. So, um, but yeah, it's important that not only do mainstream artists get the visibility, but independent, you know, artists get that same visibility as well. And just in 2020 last year you had big corporations like amazon apple pandora soundcloud mm -hmm. spotify and youtube promoting black music month um which is you know i'm kind of conflicted in some ways because you know it becomes commercialized and it becomes like oh let's how can we make money off of this and so hey. it, it's hard right. to see like i understand what they're trying to do but at the same time they're, they're also trying to make money you know, at the same time for their benefit as well. And so I understand that they're like making these, you know, curating playlists and they're highlighting artist performance, but it is, like I said, I'm conflicted as to what the whole big picture and what really they're trying to do um, when it's all said and done. Right, because, you know, it goes back to, we're trying to prevent history from repeating itself. And now you have the digital platforms who are commodifying black culture again. Mm -hmm. And how much are these underground artists really getting um, exposure right. or how, I mean, how much money are they really earning yeah. as a result of these sources? Yes, they're making money. And yes, of course, you know, they get something, but who benefits the most and the least in this process? Yep. Which leads us into our next point as far as recognizing um, the inequities, the economic mm -hmm. impact and legacy. So, you know, oftentimes and even you know sometimes a little bit now not so much now you know black artists weren't getting the proper economic gains you know right, they were right. probably touring and traveling yeah they got that but as far as that money that financial that green they weren't they weren't getting that um as they should in you know in the in proper way so we think about um uh, you mentioned um hound dog Tony Bra uh oh yeah oh. Or oh, you have to go back, you know, so like with Elvis and Hound Dog, which was, you know, like you said, recorded by Willie May or uh, Big Mama Thornton, but would be recorded by Elvis and become huge and big from him. Huge. And he became famous for it. That was one of his biggest hits, Hound Dog. 
Yeah. And yes, you know, with Big Mama Thornton, um, she it was the one of her biggest hits too. But you know, on a minor scale, it was a big hit for a black artist at that time. But you have Elvis Presley dancing to it. You know, one of his biggest hits ever. Everyone's like, "Oh, Elvis and the Hound Dog," not giving credit to Big Mama Thornton for that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, you see this happening. You know, with other black artists during that time, you had that situation with. Lil Richard. Now, everyone who know Lil Richard, now we don't know him personally, but you who know his character, he will always say, you know, I started rock and roll. Like he always, you know, really aggressively say, you know, I started this. And he was the, one of the originators of rock and roll. And so he came out with the song Tutti Fruity, which we all know, you know, Tutti Fruity was life. And, but then, you know, record labels, his record label was concerned about his appeal to white audience, especially white teenagers. And so they created a sanitized version with Pat Boone singing. And Pat Boone stayed on the charts longer and had more economic gain from the song than Little Richard, who, you know, throughout his lifetime claimed that he never got the respect he deserved. Yeah. And we all can agree to that. Yep. And it reminds me of, you remember the five heartbeats? I know you remember the five heartbeats. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that one scene where they, the record label had a, the white group sing their song. Mm -hmm. And it was like so offensive, because, but they were like, oh, we know we get more people. Yeah. And they were like, no, like this not. is not okay. Mm -hmm. Side note, um, this past Juneteenth, the five heartbeats, the original, well, the real five, the real original, or the five heartbeats came together at, I think it was a festival oh. this past month. Yes, they got together. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, oh got a a good old coming back together group, yes. No, like, Five Heartbeats won the greatest, yeah. but not to digress too much. But yes, there was a lot of black artists who, you know, never really achieved a certain level of success as they deserved, especially in the midst of this racism that was going on and still to some degree, well, still going, not to some degree, that still exists today. Mm -hmm. But you know, now you don't see many, but you know, you as you will begin to talk about. You know, for example, TLC and you know Tony Braxton. How many younger artists, black artists, were not getting what they needed, or from their contract, or the financial gain they needed from their contract, because they did not know what they were signing. And many of this comes from the fact that you know they were just excited to get a record deal. They were excited to be out there, so they did not know much about. Okay, well, make sure that your um, contract, you know, ensures you receive a good amount of money. And I remember. Um, it was in the 90s when Lisa left out Lopez, she said during the press conference, it was a big thing. And she really laid out how much they really made. Yep. And they barely made anything. Yep. But again, it goes back to, they just wanted to be famous and they did not know what was in their contract. Mm -hmm. And we see this a lot with younger black artists. Another um, group as we were thinking about these, you know, coming up with other folks who have been, you know, financially undercut, a uh, new addition. You know, so I remember, you know, it, which was one of the, a great uh, TV movie. Uh, I think the five part thing, definitely one of the best ones I've seen in a long time. Agreed, agreed. One of the best. Um, and, you know, it showed how like, even with their contracts, like it was just, they weren't getting the money that they were supposed to be getting and how, you know, it ultimately led to some shifts in the group and some breakups in the group and some, kind of coming back and going back again, you know, and breaking up again. So, um, you know, it, it, in the in the end, it's really about making sure that people get financially, you know, for sure, you know, what is owed to them. Right. I mean, that's a big part of what people, it's their career, that's their job. So you're that's getting paid for this. And so, no, it's not necessarily all about the money, but in a way, like we, we can't be uh, foolish and thinking that it's not, not about money. <laughs> right. It's like you can't take people from impoverished neighborhoods because they're talented and then take advantage of them. Exactly. Like, how does that work when, you know, Black people, we are creative, we are, you know, intelligent, things of that nature. And when we get to these rooms where we're not familiar with this, this particular speech that's in contracts, was dragging in the contract, and you take advantage of us, what, how is that promoting black artists? Right. How is that, okay, we're going to exalt black artists and black creativity, but you take advantage of them. You're commodifying black bodies and black creativity. Yep. In, in your attempt to say, oh, at least we have black artists. No, but 
you are really targeting a vulnerable community mm -hmm. and, and really using their talent for your own gain. So yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. It does happen all the time, but you know, it's something to be aware of. Right, and, and you know, we definitely need to make sure that we acknowledge the, the low, low falls because not everything has been perfect and rosy and peachy keen. Yeah. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, and we make sure to acknowledge it so that we don't repeat it, so that yeah. it doesn't happen again and doesn't happen in, you know, worse situations. So, um, you know, it's, so when it's all said and done, I'm like, this is good that we have Black Music Month, that we talk about these issues, that we mm -hmm. talk about, you know, what's happening because a lot of people are not aware. And yes, we're aware of Black music. We listen to it all the time, but mm -hmm. I think sometimes we don't know about underneath or behind yeah. the curtain, as they say. Mm -hmm. We just know about what we see and what is presented to us. And right. so, um, you know, visibility, protecting, preserving, mm -hmm. it's very important, all of those things. If you, we go back to the original, you know, thought and idea of preserve, protect, and perpetuate, mm -hmm. you know, these are all things that we have to continuously actively do as it relates to, to our music. And I'm just so appreciative that our, you know, our music is here and how it is, you know, we're coming, new artists are coming into the yes, yes, about yes. new things. I'm learning about new songs. Um, my students educate me on new artists and, and things. Cause I, you know, I got my select nineties R&B. <laughs> I know, I know. World. And sometimes I deviate outside of that a little bit, but for the most part, it's like I come back, come back to what I know. Um, but you know, it, it, it's important to step outside of your comfort zone. And yeah. I, I appreciate that because there's definitely some artists who have definitely, you know, got me out of the comfort zone and they give a good workout. You know, like many of them go onto my workout playlist. Like, yes, yeah. this is going to get me hype. It's going to get me yeah. good. So. They, I mean, I agree with that. And I think it's also important in us, like you said, that um, it's important that we understand the artists. Yep. Sometimes we just consume their work and like, oh, they sound good, they whatever, whatever. And we also feel entitled to their music. So yeah. to some degree, we need to start appreciating them as people and what they give us. So when we talk about these artists, we have to understand who they were and what they experienced. Because yes, the songs tell a story, but who's telling it? Yeah, that's part of the story too, and it's also you know going back to the commodifying their music. We need to be mindful of okay, we're not just taking advantage of this music. We appreciate them for who they are. We appreciate their background. We appreciate the gift that they're giving us. Yep. And so I think Black Music Month is great for that as well. You know, this appreciation of who artists are and what they go through just to give us what we would like. Yes, and I would also want to make sure that I acknowledge and make note not just the artists and you know but the songwriters the producers yes. all of it because you know sometimes we just see the artists and not realize that there was someone else who wrote that song there was someone else who yes. the track. there was someone else who brought those beats to the song like so we gotta we make sure we recognize everybody who's you know mm -hmm. a part of of the musical process because uh those those songwriters that you know everybody just can't write a song it's not it's not easy <laughs> you know if it was everybody would do it and everybody and they try, try. They try. <laughs> and so. one thing t Payne said i think it was in a tweet he was like you know you really like you like these songs but you really like the producers who produce these beats yes, yes. and so he made a good point where it's like it takes a lot to create a song yep it takes like you said the songwriters the producers everything to help the technicians Everyone's involved in making making sure this song sounds great for consumers. So yep. everyone should be acknowledged. Exactly. And speaking of acknowledgement and recognition and black joy, you know, we couldn't leave you all without giving y'all our kind of like black joy soundtrack, you know, and you know, what songs hit us, you know, yeah. in, in a certain special kind of way. And know that, you know, we, we only pick six and know that this was oh. hard pick six and that mm -hmm. this is not exhaustive you know th there's much more but for the purpose of you know kind of like selecting six and this was hard for me because i like to give more than that more than that but i was yeah. only relegated to six songs thank you dr robinson i didn't say six <laughs> <laughs> but uh um, i did i said six. you did so we want to offer our what we like to call personal black joy and happiness soundtrack yeah. um these are in no particular type of order. 
they just, you know, we just want to share a little bit and, you know, uh, please feel free to share your, your songs that will be on your Black Joy and Happiness soundtrack. And, you know, we can maybe come up with something, put it on Spotify and, you know, and, you share know, yeah. others and make other people aware of, of artists that maybe we didn't know about. So I'm going to um, have Kaniqua kick, kick us off with, uh, with her life soundtrack. Okay, I'm going to do one song and then you do one song. Okay. Okay, so my first song is Earth, Wind, and Fire, On Your Face. So I really appreciate that song. First of all, I did not know it was sampled by so many people. Mm -hmm. So I, wait, I, well, I knew the sampled songs. I didn't know the original song. And I was actually um, here, in, well, I was in Pittsburgh, and Arunde Sharif, who's um, a lecturer in the Department of African Studies, made me listen to, like, several, well, not made me, but he, like, you know, told me to listen to several songs. And I was like, this song is great. It's like there's nothing you can do about it. So just enjoy your life. Like have fun, you know? And so that was mine. I just want to ask. So my first one is Stevie Wonder's As and I've always I'm so I'm a huge Stevie Wonder fan. Let me just put that out of my So there was gonna be a song at least from him on my soundtrack. Um and this is a song that I have always treasured. I like the fact that it's it's a long song. It, you know, I like <laughs> But that's okay. I like that. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate the instruments, his vocals, everything about it. You know, the artistry is just, is great. Yeah. And it would kind of, in a way, get this like reawakening when it was on the Best Man soundtrack. And I remember hearing him being like, oh, see, they did it. They done done it right there when you put that song. I remember watching the movie in here and I said, I know they didn't just get they didn't just put Stevie Wonder's ass on here. Oh, I was just, See, I that's was, why. I, that's why I first heard the song. I didn't hear the song before then. It was on that movie, in that movie. Whew, yeah, classic song. Yes. What's your next one? Missy Elliott's "The Rain." Of course. Okay. First of all, I'm a huge Missy Elliott fan. You are. And uh, if you really oh, see several things for me, I will talk about Missy Elliott quite a lot. Um. When this song came out, I was, well, when the video came out, it was like, look at this woman in the trash bag. Look at her, and but look at her loving herself. See, I'm all about, and my songs, they tend to be uplifting and joyful because just like you said, it's about what do I listen to to really make me feel good. And I love the beat. I love the rhythm. I love how she shouted out her friends in the song. I love how, you know, she, she was just great. And in, even in her image in this video, she was just otherworldly. She was great to me. So it was Missy Elliott. All right, all right. right. Um, my next one is Outcast, Two Dope Boys and a Cadillac from the AT Aliens um, album. Um, it came out in 1996. So I'm, I'm not an AT Alien, but Outcast and Goody Mob were the first two hip hop albums that I purchased in Illinois, in Champaign, Illinois. They were the first two hip hop albums um, that I, I bought, Southern Playlist of Cadillac Music and Still Standing. And I just remember hearing them and being like, oh, I'm loving this. And, you know, I was listening to hip hop and, um, you know, hip hop and rap already, but it was something that they brought to the table that was unique and different. And they will tell you, you know, as you all know about Outkast, like they are unique and different and they bring a yeah. flavor hip hop and not you know and rap that you know you it's the originators of that in a way yes they are so to speak and so you know the song two dope boys in the cadillac i mean <laughs> you know the fact that they talking about their time you know coming up from the south being in A atlanta you know just the fashion who they were just like real chill cool dudes and uh, for me, that just, it, I, like I said, I'm not from Atlanta, but it resonated their chill, that, that chill that they had resonated with me a lot. That, that attitude that they had, I was like, I like that. I can roll with that. So, um, you know, I'm, I was definitely on, on, on Outkast before everybody in the bag wag, bandwagon did. And like I said, yeah. I was in the Midwest and I was loving them already. So, um, yeah, that would be my second one. Two Dope Boys in the Cadillac from Outkast. Okay, that Midwest love, that was excellent. That was excellent. I'm here for that one. I'll catch forever. Yep. Um, I, my next one is Richard Smallwood and Dunning McClurkin, Total Prey. So you talk about spirituality, well, spirituals, and how gospel is important to the Black community. So Total Praise is one of the most popular songs. I'm not saying be popular, because so many songs, but 
one of the most popular songs being sung by Black Choir. Mm -hmm. And I love yeah. Total Praise, which was arranged by Richard Smallwood, the great yeah. Richard Smallwood. And also I love the version of with yeah. Dunny McClurkin because I just love yeah. Dunny McClurkin. Mm -hmm. Every time I hear this song, it just sends me. I just absolutely love it. And yeah, so that's it. Okay. Wait, no, in addition to that, Dunny is just great. I almost had several Dunny McClurkin songs because he's one of my favorite um, gospel artists, artists, period. And again, Total Praise is a big song in the Black community. Oh, yeah. I remember when I got into the adult choir and we sang Total Praise. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> that was, a, okay, I know there was a children's choir, but we don't really call it adult choir like it was. <laughs> There's no, it, it's not adult choir. I, I'm just referring to it because, you know, I was in the children's <laughs> choir and then, you know, you went to, I'm trying to remember what it was, mass choir. I can't remember the exact name. You know, forgive me, Lord, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah um see, see, i my, love that my next song is from uh reflection eternal which is also known as which is comprised of the duo talib kwali and producer high tech um featuring reese and the song too late so i was not was i am you know definitely a huge early hip-hop fans so I mm -hmm. was like who, who you know what are your you know favorite lyricists and artists and rap artists you know I'm always going with Talib I'm going with Black Thought I'm going with folks who people don't talk about them too much now um but like your early comment early comment early comment um so um yeah so uh, Too Late from Reflection Eternal featuring Reese that would be my number three uh, okay I like that I like that I like that you are a big, you can tell you're a big early hip hop fan. Yeah, um, early hip hop, I have to clarify for that. <laughs> you did, <laughs> I mean, you do have to clarify because you really do like early hip hop, that's your life. Like, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. My next one is, of course, back in the day, I was in middle school, I believe, when Lauren Hill, Miss Lauren Hill, I apologize, came out with the miseducation of Lauren Hill. Is it called that? I think, yeah, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill. Okay, yeah. I'll make sure that was right. Okay, so when she came out with this album, it exploded, okay? Like, it was amazing. So all the songs, you can listen to the album completely. One of my favorites, one of them, is Everything is Everything. Mm -hmm. And I remember I sing it all, not all the time. Again, I'm not going to sing it for you, but, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't listen to it. But it's pretty much saying Everything is Everything. You know, change will happen, but it's okay. If anything happens, you can you'll be okay. Like everything is everything, you know. That video was off the chain too. Right? Yeah, it was great. Like she was just saying, like after winter must come spring. Anyway, change will come eventually. Like it's okay. <laughs> That's the word right there. <laughs> the word. Do you understand? From total praise to everything is everything. Like that is life. Yes. Whew. All right. All right. Uh, what I got next for you? So. Drew Hills, Beauty, released in 1998, so I was high school still. It's the opening of that song, before they even get to singing, before they even drop the verse, it's the opening, you know, it's like this, like you can hear like a record playing in the back, it's kind of has that sound of like the thing that you put on the record and it's that sizzle kind of noise, tight. that song right there, every time, classic slow jam song, when I would hear it on the radio, I would like, yeah. Oh, it hits my heart. It hits my heart. Drew Hill's amazing. It is. This was, you know, Drew Hill, early Drew Hill before, because, you know, they've kind of changed their members and all that good stuff. But this is early beginnings of Drew Hill. Um, classic song for me from them. And, um, yeah, so that that's that's my, my next one. I just want to say Drew Hill never stopped being, like, like you said, you know, even with all the great changes they've made, they've always been excellent. I love Drew Hill until they stop. Um, yeah. And my favorite, just want to throw it out there, Drew Hill is Five Steps. I love that song. I love that song too. I love Five Steps. Isn't that one that Woody, didn't, doesn't he lead that yes, one? Yes, he leads it. Yes, that and So Special, he leads that one too at the beginning. Yeah. So that was good. And also in the middle, but yeah, I love Drew Hill. I love Drew Hill. Okay, I don't know how this ended up on my list, but my next song is Kanye West Famous featuring Rihanna. I think it was produced by Swiss Beat. I really love that song. Um, I think it's excellent. Like it's, it's great and it's hype, you know, and then at the end of it, they have a sample from Nina Simone. 
All right. Yes. And I was like, this is a nice song. You know, I can't really say the lyric, but you know, it's really good. And you know, that was one of Kanye West's good songs. That's all I would say about that. And what, before I go into the next thing, I replaced that with, I, you know, it was between two songs. I think I told you in the middle that was in the five heartbeats. <laughs> <laughs> so close. It was almost in the middle because that's a, this five heartbeat soundtrack. Yeah. Is glorious. Okay. Um, but in the middle was there. It was there. Okay. All right. All right. The famous is great too. I don't know. I didn't know which one to choose, but yeah. As we said, it's hard to just limit to six for here because we got a whole, you know, whole album we could probably create of, of our of our top songs. Yes. Um, let's see. What I got next for y'all. So going back to old you know, old school hip hop, um, one of my favorite groups, A Tribe Called Quest, and their song A War Tour, which uh so it's a couple of friends, they have a running joke. So like when I'm all when I was always traveling all the time, they were like, Grace, where are you going on your award tour today? Where's your what's your next stop today? And so um, you oh. know, I always liked this song and then when they that kind of became my personal theme song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, you're on a war tour. It is. <laughs> you're about to go right in. I was about to go into it. Oh, let me hold myself. But yeah, uh, Tribe Called Quest award tour. That's uh, my, my fifth song. And I think, okay, I think that's really good. Okay, award tour. Mine is, my last song is Outcast and Macy Gray, Greatest Show on Earth, which is on the Idlewild movie and soundtrack. Like, you will see, I think it's um, earlier in the movie but it's on the soundtrack. I love it because I love Macy Gray's voice. I love the uniqueness of it. Um, I also love her song, I Try, but um, not, not my top at this time, but I really love, because when I hear the song, it makes me happy. I don't know why. I just get so excited when I hear that song. Actually, the entire Idlewild soundtrack yeah. is excellent. Like um, Hollywood Divorce, um, She Lives in My Lap. Um, was Bowtie on there or was Bowtie on another? I think. Bowtie was on there. I think so. Yes, it was. Bowtie was on there. Um, but, you know, so that's mine. It really makes me excited. I really love it. Mm -hmm. Cool. So my last song, so apropos with, you know, this, this podcast today, this episode today comes from Nina Simone and it is her song called Baltimore. And so it was, came out in 1978. And she uh, recorded it while she was living in Paris. So this is one of the moments where she was like, I had to leave y'all up here in the U.S. Um, and so, um, yeah, you know, that's one of it's the, the music, the song, the um, instruments. Once again, you know, she had just a great sound with it for me. And I remember hearing it actually on a TV show. Um, again, once again, you know, like these are songs that I had listened to that are not necessarily like right. pop hits or whatever. But, you know, these TV shows and movies, you know, pick it up and you're like, I remember, I know that song. <laughs> and so it was kind of like a refresher, you know, hearing it. I can't remember the TV show that I saw it from, but once I did hear it, I immediately, you know, shazammed it and put it on my, uh, yeah. my fly list or my playlist. So, um, yeah. And Baltimore is actually one of uh, my, yeah, I like going to Baltimore as far as visiting. It's, it's you right. know. Not a lot of people talk about the city, but there's a there's a lot going on with the city, especially if you think about um, pop culture wise from mm -hmm. um, The Wire and several other you know different TV shows um, that kind of came out of um, out of Baltimore. So yeah, it's it's a, it's an unspoken. City. A lot of people don't talk about it that much, but it's a great city, a lot to yeah. offer. They got good they got good seafood, you know, for those who like seafood. So, but yeah, Nina Simone song. Um, Baltimore that closes out my uh, personal black joy and happiness soundtrack. I like your soundtrack. It was really nice. I, yes, yes. Thank I like you. We have to combine it and you yes. know, to get that out to you all. Um, and like I said, definitely share you guys's you know um, songs and what you know makes your list, what makes your top six you know soundtrack mm -hmm. list. Because um, it's all about appreciate it, not just this month, but every other month. Right, right. You know, we, you know, I, I, you know, I'm just so appreciative that we do have a, the celebration, and I'm so glad that we're recognizing it and acknowledging and making sure that people, artists, are getting, you know, the visibility that they deserve, and that we're having these discussions about it too. 
And I want to add to that, even based on the song Famous, which yeah. you know, is very interesting to me. I, I still love it. I love it. Um, but the fact that I even learned more about Nina Simone after listening to that song, like even listening to the original song, I was like, oh, wow, this is nice. And so I do love how hip hop artists have started to sample and giving credit. And, you know, one thing I will say, Kanye West is good for that. Yeah. You will sample a song and then, you know, give credit to older people, uh, not older people, but, you know, their predecessor, um, his predecessors. But um, I think Black History Month is the Black History Month. Black Music Month is great in really, you know, truly encouraging us to understand our music and who we are in our music and how our music is part of who we are. Um, and another thing is, I think, you know, even in the midst of this, watch some movies that's dedicated to um, Black groups like The Temptations, The Five Heartbeat, Blue Richard, Tina documentary. What's that got to do with it? Yep. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple things. Yeah. So we are so glad that you were able to tune in with us again on our summertime conversation on feeling good, um, exploring the lived experience, the Black joy. Yes, through music. The music, you know, from our previous episode on Juneteenth. And so um, we just, you know, we're glad that we were able to offer a little bit of summertime dialogue to you all today and uh, this month. And, you know, I said, we look forward to hearing you guys' thoughts and, and, you know, what else should we be talking about? What should we bring into the table for you all? Right. Like something that, you know, makes you happy, that you want to learn more about, that you want us to really interrogate. To exactly. really understand ourselves. So we may not know anything about it, but it, it's the opportunity for us to discuss it and learn more. Yep. So you let us know what you're interested in hearing from us. Indeed, indeed. So until the next time, you all enjoy your summer, be safe, make sure you have that black joy, have that fellowship, enjoy life, and, and we'll see you all next time.